Morning, everybody. Uh, you're welcome to close that door back there. The chemistry students are doing something weird. Um, so, no grass tomorrow, no lab on Monday, right? Um, and then next week is quote unquote normal in terms of like the lecture, but then the week after that, we are having our exam, aren't we? I think I got that right. So just keep that all um, in mind. Uh, you guys have homework due this Saturday? That's really mean of your teacher, isn't it? We'll keep it, we'll, we'll keep, we'll keep it the same. I know, four-day weekend, but we'll keep, the, keep the due date the same. Um, all right. God, God, I, the number of demonstrations I have today is extreme. Um, and we'll see how many of them we get to. I did want to continue on though. We did the lightning strike problem last time and um, I brought, I wanted to talk about this, okay? Back in the day when hard drives were hard drives. I mean, look at this thing, right? This, this hard drive right here, okay, can store a whopping one megabyte. <laughs> Okay. Wow. Now, why am I why did I bring it? I, I, I kept, somebody said, can we throw this away? I'm like, no! <laughs> like, not only is this a piece of ancient history, it's amazing as a demonstration, right? Okay, so how do hard drives work? You have these spinning disks, okay? These are made of metal. Most of the days, uh, hard drives, plates are made of a, a type of ceramic, almost glass material. I'm gonna send this one around so you can see it. Just be careful, there are some sharp edges on this thing because I took the, took the lid off and it exposed some of the sharp edges. But just so you can see a hard drive up close, just pass that around, play around with it, see what it's like. But you've got these spinning platters that contain the data, okay? And there is this read-write head that goes across the surface of the platter. And in that read-write head is a coil of wire, okay? It's hard to see because my picture's kind of blurry, but there's a metal coil on the end of this read-write head, and that read-write head passes very close to the surface of the platter as they spin. Well, the platter is magnetized. When you write information, it orients different magnetic domains on the surface. And when it reads, as those domains pass under that read head, it changes the magnetic field through the coil. And so that means that the flux has changed. And if the flux of the coil changes, you, you've detected something, and you call that a one. And when you don't detect anything, you call it a zero. And now what are you reading a constant stream of? Binary ones and zeros, encoding your term paper or whatever it is, okay? So the idea here, right, is that Faraday's law of electromagnetic induction is helping us store everything that we see on Instagram and TikTok and Facebook and everything else, right? I mean, there's other forms of storage out there. There's solid state storage. It doesn't use any moving parts. But a vast majority of any data that's in the cloud or on the internet is stored on hard drive. Um, it's cached or temporarily stored in solid state. The solid state is very expensive to scale. And so you typically, like all the Google servers, everything, hard drive. It's where it's being stored uh, because you can store lots of stuff for very cheap. I'm going to yell at the chemistry teacher real quick. What? Scared. You had the chemistry teacher knew I was going to go yell at him because the sound stopped. Right? There's no more sound coming? Okay. All right, good. I'll yell at the chemistry teacher later. <laughs> All right. With fixed videos, I can now show you. I have no idea why that problem was happening. I simply rebooted my computer. We'll use this wire and a large horseshoe magnet to demonstrate generation of currents from motion in a magnetic field. The wire is hooked to this galvanometer to measure the currents produced. When the wire is moved in the field of the magnet, the meter deflects.
As soon as the motion stops, the meter goes back to zero, showing that the current has disappeared. Pulling the wire back out of the magnetic field produces a current in the opposite direction. If we turn the magnet over and repeat the same motions, the directions of the currents are reversed. I showed you this video. I did this demonstration, but I did it where I had a big coil that was stationary and I was moving the magnet. This is the reverse of that. But as far as Faraday's law of electromagnetic induction is concerned, it doesn't matter. You can move a wire in and out of a magnetic field, or you can change a magnetic field near a coil of wire. Flux, change in flux is change in flux, right? If you're changing magnetic field, you're changing orientation, you're changing the size of the, size of the area, you're going to have this effect happen. Okay. The rest of it is kind of like engineering about how you're going to capture that. When a wire coil swings between the poles of a magnet, a voltage is generated in the coil. We'll use this coil connected to a small light bulb to show how that voltage changes as the speed of the moving coil is increased. If we swing the coil into the magnet slowly, the light bulb does not react. slow-mo of something that didn't happen. Aren't, aren't you excited? Yay. Okay, fine. He looks interested in what he's doing. A slightly faster swing produces only a dim light. No, we didn't see anything. Try again. Okay, there was a little tiny flash there. This will not be exciting, I promise you. A faster swing lights the bulb brightly. You see it flashing up there? And then it dies off, right? Okay, as it comes in. So this effect, and you can see the bulb flashing up there. This effect, right? Faraday's law of electromagnetic induction doesn't just rely on a change in flux. It's also relies on the amount of time it takes that change in flux to happen, right? And so the faster you can change the magnetic flux, the bigger the voltage and hence current that you are going to get in an electrical circuit. So with all that in mind, let's do a quiz. Okay. But not only do I believe in being strong and wrong, I believe in being strong and right. <laughs> okay. When, um, when I introduced you to Faraday's Law of Electromagnetic Induction, I very quickly dodged a minus sign and told you you come back to it later. Well, it's now later. Okay? That minus sign right there is a reminder of Lenz's Law. What well, Lenz's Law states it's going to be very complicated, and we're going to disentangle this on a lot of different levels. But what Lenz's law states is that a coil will create an EMF in order to oppose the change in flux through that coil. And I know, I know, I know that sounds esoteric and abstracted and weird. And why does that matter? I'm going to do a bunch of demonstrations about why it matters, but let's, let's untangle what this minus sign is trying to tell us. This minus sign sits opposite, not the number of turns, but a change in magnetic flux. And so what that minus sign does is it reminds us of the physical truth that a coil like this one is going to fight changes in magnetic flux through it. And the way it's going to fight those changes, that minus delta piece of V, the way it's going to fight those changes is to slow down the rate at which flux changes through it. So a coil always wants to fight the change. The implication there, then, is that we have to be able to identify what the change in flux is and the direction that it happens to be happening. So this, this is your first time through it, 
and it's going to feel real confusing. But let me let me try to help you through this. Okay, this is going to involve multiple right hand rules and keeping track of directions and all that kind of stuff. So just hang on for the ride, and we'll we'll, we'll pick up the pieces on the other side. Let's say that I have a coil, let's just, let's just drop a coil, a circular coil of wire, okay? And it starts with no flux through it at all. There's no magnetic field, there's nothing going on. We know that if we bring a magnet closer and closer to this coil, that the flux will change, right? It goes from having no field to having some amount of field. So we know that the flux will increase, and that means that we are going to get an EMF, a voltage and a current, flowing in that coil. What Lenz's law attempts to do, or tells us, is the direction that that current and EMF are going to take. And the direction does become important later. So what do, how, do we, how do we do this? I've kind of come up with a three-step process that keeps me safe as I go through Lenz's Law. If I don't do this, I invariably will end up making a mistake. i got to make sure I remember the three-step process in order here. Where is it? Ah, here we go. Okay. <clears throat> so... The first step in applying Lenz's Law, this is a totally conceptual thing. Like the math is Faraday's Law of Electromagnetic Induction, but that minus sign is all about Lenz's Law. The first thing you're going to do, okay, is you're going to determine how the flux is changing. Okay. You're looking for an increase or a decrease in the magnitude, but you also want direction. So flux can change. So flux has a direction associated with it. The magnetic field through that loop could be into or out of the screen. So that's the direction. But we also need to know and understand whether or not it's getting stronger or weaker, increasing or decreasing. So that's like the first step is being able to identify that. The second step, and we're going to do a bunch of examples and practice with this, okay, um, is you, you apply Lenz's law, right, which states that the coil is going to fight the change. And I'll explain what that means here in a second. And then number three, you're going to use a right-hand rule to find the EMF and the current in that loop. So it's a three-step process. How is the flux changing? If it's not changing, what's the answer? Zero. There's no direction. Nothing's happening. Okay? So find how the flux is changing. Increasing or decreasing and the direction. Figure step two, apply Lenz's law by figuring out how to fight that. And then use a right hand rule based on what Lenz's law told you to find the direction of the current. Okay. So let's 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 pull this apart. Okay. So if I take up a magnet, okay, um, the eraser is now a magnet, okay? And I have the north pole of this magnet, and I'm bringing it closer and closer to the screen, right? I'm coming in towards that circular coil of wire. Is the flux increasing, decreasing, or staying the same? What do you think? It's increasing, right? Because we're going from zero magnetic field in the coil to having a magnet that's really close to the coil, that's an increase in magnetic field. So in my example here, whoops, okay, is number one, I know it's increasing. Okay, I've established that it's increasing. Okay, 
What about directions? As the north pole of my magnet is towards my coil, what direction will the magnetic field be pointing near the coil? Into or out of the screen? Into, right? Magnetic fields come out of north poles, right? And so the magnetic field would be pointing into, I'd be getting magnetic field pointing into the coil, into the screen, through the coil. So it's increasing into. There's two parts there, right? Okay. A relative, is it getting bigger, stronger, or staying bigger or weaker, and st or staying the same? And then also, what is the direction of that magnetic field that's causing the increase or decrease in flux? Okay, step two, Lenz's law. Lenz's law tells us that the coil is going to fight the change. And the only thing the coil can do is make magnetic field. That's all it can do. It can't like, it can't like make an anti-magnetic field, okay? It can only produce things. And so Lenz's law, its statement always starts with increase. That is always going to be the same word. The coil is going to make magnetic flux that fights the change. And so if the change is at increasing into the screen, the only way to fight something that's getting stronger pointed in is to make something that's pointed out. That's how we're going to cancel Lenz's law wants to cancel the flux, the change in flux. We know that flux is pointed in too. We know it's getting bigger. And so the coil is going to say, ah, uh ah, -uh, ah, uh ah, -uh, I don't like this. And so it's going to make or increase flux in the opposite direction. So in this case, it's going to increase out. Now that we've established from Lenz's law, the flux that the coil is making, we are now going to use a right-hand rule in order for, to find the direction of the current. I haven't showed you this right-hand rule yet, because I don't think I talked about it. Right? It's how you find the magnetic field of a current-carrying coil. So we did straight wires, didn't we? Okay. And when you do a straight wire, right, you do the thumb in the direction of the current, and your fingers wrap around the wire in the circulating magnetic field. Okay. But what about a coil? A coil is just a straight wire that's bent around, isn't it? So let's say that, uh, I don't know. I'll do it on the iPad so everybody can see it on YouTube and everything else. Let, let's take a coil over here. Okay, and let's say that the current is flowing around this way. Okay, it's going in a counterclockwise direction. I can take my thumb and I can run it around this coil in the direction that the current is flowing. My thumb is pointing around the coil, right? And I, I'm constantly having to change the direction my wrist is pointing. But my fingers will wrap around that wire such that no matter where I am on this coil, which way are my fingers pointing at the center? They're pointing out, aren't they? Now that's a lot of work, right? To kind of take that right hand rule and kind of go all the way around like this, right? Okay, you look crazy enough doing this in the library, okay? We don't need to add this, okay? So there is a reverse of that rule. You can take your fingers and curl them in the direction of the current. And then your thumb is what? The direction of the magnetic field. And this is where the confusion begins. Right? Because it now seems like we have three right-hand rules. What are they? Pew, pew. Right? Which is involves what? Force. It's got field in it, but it's like current and velocity and force, right? 
force on a wire. If you're being asked about force on a wire, it's pew pew, right? If you're being asked like what direction is the current going because the force is pushing something, then you pew pew, right? Okay. And then we have the hitchhiker, which is all about finding the field, the magnetic field created by a current carrying wire, right? There's no force in there. We have this one where the thumb is the current, but now I've taught you one where your fingers are the current. Like, how do you know which one to do? Look at the shape of the current. For a straight wire, your thumb being relatively straight is the wire, right? But for a coil, you use your fingers, right? Because the current is coiling around and then your thumb becomes the field. That's how I remember it, okay? Let me see your, let me see your thumb. Can I pick on you? Yes. Hold your, hold your, do, do, look at that. You see how bent over it, you know, thumb is? Okay, if I'm correct, and I think I am, that's the dominant gene, yeah. okay? Uh, it's called hitchhiker thumb. Do you see how straight mine is? Like really straight up and down? Some of you have got ones that like really bend over. Okay, there's nothing wrong with you. Okay, <laughs> but I'm just pointing out, you want the straight part of your thumb. If you've got the front thumb that goes over, right? Okay, try to, okay. So, thank you. Right, but yeah, you got a yeah, good ditch. I could, yeah. Yeah, right? Anybody else out there got that nice? Oh, ho, ho. Colville, hold your hand up. Look at that one, that's fantastic. Right, love it. Okay, biology is so interesting sometimes. <laughs> Until they start trying to name stuff, and then it all falls apart. Okay, you know that I'm not a fan of taxonomy. Okay, so what was it? Oh, increasing out, right? So if we know that the coil is going to create an outward magnetic field, field points out, it's a coil, right? So my finger, right? So if the field is pointing out, my fingers are now wrapping around which way? Clockwise or counterclockwise? Counterclockwise. And so now I have found the direction that the voltage, oops, the voltage and current, come on, draw an arrow. Voltage and current are in this wire. Let's do another one. I'm going to take that same magnet now. Okay. So let me. Um, uh, we'll come down here and recycle. Okay. So I'm going to take the same coil, and now I've got my north pole of my magnet really close to this coil, and now I'm going to take it away. So I don't really have a way to animate this, but we start with magnetic field inside the coil, and then as we pull the coil away, the magnetic field disappears. First step, figure out how the flux is changing. In this case, did the flux increase, decrease, or stay the same? It decreased. Okay. What direction was the flux pointing, the magnetic field pointing? It was still in two, wasn't it? The north pole of my magnet was here. I was pulling it away, but the, the magnetic field lines are still coming out of my magnet, going into the screen, right? It's just they're getting less and less, right? So it's like, you know, these, the, 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 the X's are disappearing, right? Okay, as, the, as the permanent magnet goes away. So we know it's decreasing because we're getting less and less field in the magnet, but it's still pointed into the screen. So that's how the flux is changing. Step two, apply Lenz's law. Lenz's law always starts with the word what? Increase. Okay? It all, you can't decrease with Lenz's law. You can only increase. You can make, you can't destroy or anti-make. Okay? So how do you, if the only choice is, is that you can make magnetic flux, and you want to fight a decrease of that magnetic flux, what are you going to do? 
you're going to increase in the same direction. To find a decreasing into, you would do an increasing into. The coil wants to keep what it started with. It's always trying to fight the change. And so it had a lot of magnetic field. And so therefore the coil is going to come in and say, wait, 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 I want it back. And so it's going to make field. It's going to increase into. And now that we know it's increasing into, we take our newfound right hand rule. And what do we do with our thumb? Where does it go? into the screen following the direction the magnetic field is taking. And which way does our hand coil around? Clockwise. How many things do you need to think about in order to get through this? A lot. <laughs> right? You're... You're wrestling with flux in the first place. It's kind of a new idea. I mean, we've been through it a couple of times now, but still, this is not something you practice every day, and you should. But you've got that problem. And then we have the additional step of you have to find the change in flux, which is always so hard for everybody, physicists included, because it's just like velocity versus acceleration. And you just want to always think that velocity acceleration is saying, no, one's a change in the other. And so holding on to that concept and idea that something is changing, also difficult. And then we're throwing on top of that like a statement that says, well, then once you figure that out, reverse it. And then we're saying, OK, but now there's a new right hand rule <laughs> to be able to survive with car. This stuff is nuts. So, so let's try. Let's try to maybe write down all the possibilities for what can happen. So what, what are the possibilities for changing flux? For this step number one, we could have increasing into. That's one possibility, right? We're increasing the magnetic field, and it's directed into the page. But we can also have the possibility that we're increasing out of the page. The magnetic field could be the other direction and getting stronger. And then we could have the magnetic field getting weaker pointed into the page or getting weaker pointing out of the page. Those are the four possibilities for changing flux. I'm using into and out here, but you can change that word with through the coil, right? Into the, or through the coil, and then maybe out of the coil. But the point is, is that there's a magnetic field. It has direction through a closed coil of wire, and it's either getting stronger or weaker. So that's step one. Step two, how do we oppose these four possibilities? So how do you oppose an increasing into if you must start every single one of these statements with the word increasing? This is where my handwriting gets really bad because I get bored writing the same thing over and over again. I was bad in school and they made me write the 100 times things. Oh my God. <laughs> it got bad. Okay, so how do you fight? How do you go against an increasing into by increasing? Increasing out. Right? Okay, how do you fight an increasing out? Increasing into. Increasing into. Lenz's law fights the change in flux. Whatever the change in flux is, try to reverse it, but you can only make new stuff to reverse it, to fight it. Okay? How do you fight a decreasing into? 
increasing into, and how do you find it decreasing out? Increasing out. So there's, there's a table, if you will, of all the possibilities, right? So that we've offloaded a little bit of the cognitive load of figuring out what the opposite of this thing is. Now you know what all the opposites are. And now you know how Lenz's law will be. So now we've really got to focus on nailing that change in flux, right? If we can get the change in flux, boom, we know what Lenz's law is going to say. And then once we know the direction over there, we apply our right-hand rule, right? And in this case, your thumb is the direction in, out from Lenz's law, and your fingers will be the direction of the current, right? So I'll just, I'll just put down three right-hand rules. <laughs> Okay, for whatever the given situation happens to be. All right, so with all of that in play, let's do several examples. Um, all right, so um, you can picture these a lot of different ways. Let's do, let's do a coil of wire, okay? And I have the, south pole of a magnet right close to this loop of wire. And I'm going to take that south pole and I'm going to pull it away from the screen. So what I want you to do right now, knowing that I've got a south pole near the, you know, right in front of the screen, okay, and I pull that away, I want you to try and find the direction of induced current in that coil. Do it yourself. I'm going to let you help each other here in a second. Okay, I think I've made you suffer long enough. Turn to each other, figure out what the flux is doing, apply it, and find the direction. Go. Flux increasing or decreasing? Why is it decreasing? It's moving away, right? Magnetic field depends on distance. The distance gets bigger. So it's a decrease. What direction is the magnetic field pointing if the south pole of the magnet's right next to that coil? It's pointing out. Remember, magnetic fields go into south poles. So as it passes through the plane of coil coming into a south pole, like that. Okay, so it's decreasing out. What does our table tell us that Newton's law, uh, Lenz's law is going to do? It's going to increase out. So when we apply our right hand rule, what do we do with our thumb? Out of the screen. Which way are our fingers rotating? Counterclockwise. <laughs> How? 
how does a physics teacher grade a problem like this? How, yeah, you kind of get it or you don't, right? Like, I can't give partial credit for messing up <laughs> the direction of the course, right? Okay? It's like, you really have to kind you just got to do it, right? And so, in your upcoming exam, you're going to be mad at me, <laughs> okay? <laughs> because I will have taken off, like, all the points, <laughs> right? For getting this wrong. Because it's, it, it's kind of all or nothing. It really is. Either you get the change in flux or you don't. It always gives rise to all the jokes on the t-shirts and things like that, right? With the flux. <laughs> what the flux are you doing? Anyway, uh, usually with a right hand rule picture on it or something. All right, so uh, let's, do, let's do this. Um, these are, this again, okay, so visualizing this can be kind of hard. Especially when you do something like this, okay? We're going to drop a magnet with its uh, south pole oriented downwards. We're going to drop this through the coil. So it's going to start up high. It's going to pass through the coil and leave towards the bottom, okay? So there's really kind of two things that are happening here, right? It falls, right? It, it's in between and then it gets down here, right? In the south and the north, okay? That kind of stuff. So as seen from above, so this is my attempt at a three-dimensional drawing, right, okay? As seen from above, right, where the coil, would look circular as seen from above, right? And we're taking, right, with the north end pointed towards us and the south end pointed towards the page, it falls into and goes all the way through that coil. Determine the direction, plural, of the induced current in that coil. Consider the fact that it's approaching and then moving away from. So there, there's two, you need two answers to this one. Why don't you go ahead and start helping each other out? It's like really talk through it about what's increasing, decreasing, directions, all that kind of stuff on either side of that loop. Go. I think this is similar to like um, the like physics to it, you know, like a sound problem where there is like I think it's gonna be similar to that except with this So when you have like part one which is the fact that it's falling down, right? So that one would be MPC, right? And then once it comes out, I don't yeah, know the it is the yeah. 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 Do we need to know the whole of the coil itself? Is that? Do we need to know the whole of the coil? Right. Oh, yeah, like, yeah. Well, then the direction of the current's going. Okay, so I guess you don't need to know that. That's what we're finding out. Yes. Um, yeah, so I don't know. Okay, what direction is the magnetic field pointed as the South Pole approaches this? Coil. It's pointing out. 
right? It's going into, magnetic field lines go into the South Pole, right? So that means in the plane of the page is this thing, right? Goes through. I have a pointing outwards magnetic field in the plane of the coil. Okay? That's the first challenge. Uh, let's uh, also talk about the direction that it has after it's passed through. So now that it's passed through, what direction is the magnetic field pointed in that coil? Still out of the screen. <laughs> All of your brains just stop. Okay. I'm going to draw, this is a side view of the coil as the magnet, this is the south and north side, right? And the magnet's coming this way, right? Which way are the magnetic field lines pointed? They go into the south pole, right? But from our point of view, flat on, it's pointing out of the screen, right? Okay. So now that magnet has passed through the coil with its north side over here and its south side over here. Which way are those field lines pointed through the coil? Same direction. The direction of the magnetic field did not change. I know. I know. <laughs> you're, at, you're at peak visualization capacity, right? Brain.exe has stopped working. Draw pictures. Think about it. Contemplate magnetic fields and around bar magnets, right? I only drew half of the field here, right? I mean, technically on this side, they'd be coming out like that, right? And these would be going in on that side, right? But it's, it's only through, you know, the, what the magnetic field is doing through that coil that matters. So whether, no matter which side this magnet is on this coil, the magnetic field is pointed out. So, on its way towards the coil, is the flux increasing or decreasing? It's increasing, right? It's getting stronger as it goes towards the coil, right? Okay? So if it's increasing out, what does Lenz's law tell us? Increasing in, my thumb goes in, and what direction do my fingers coil? Clockwise. So as that magnet falls towards that coil of wire, it's going to induce a clockwise circulation of current and voltage. OK. Now the magnet passes through. Is the flux increasing or decreasing as the magnet gets further away? It's decreasing. Decreasing into. So what does Lenz's law tell us about a decreasing into? How do we fight it? We increase into, which way does our thumb point? Sorry, increase out. I'm just going to say. See, even I get it backwards. Rewind. It's decreasing out, <laughs> not decreasing into. <laughs> it's decreasing pointing out of the screen. So what does Lenz's Law say? Increase out. Your thumb points out, and which way do our fingers turn? Counterclockwise. So it goes clockwise to counterclockwise. But in order to go from clockwise to counterclockwise, what must the current and voltage pass through? Zero. So it would go clockwise to nothing, that's when the magnet is exactly centered in that coil, to the other direction. So by dropping a magnet through, we get a single rotation alternation of the direction in this coil. And this is the beginning of alternating current. Now, if we can get that magnet to like continuously fall through, or even bounce up and down, 
then we can get alternating current to be consistent. And that's exactly what happens in a generator. It's not a falling magnet, it's a rotating coil. As that coil rotates through, 180 degrees of that turn, you have an increasing one direction, and then the other 180 degrees, you have the opposite direction, and so the current is going to wiggle back and forth. And yes, we are going to do some AC circuits, but not right now, because I've got to show you some other things. I got to show you why all of this is important to you. Starting with the video that doesn't seem all that tied to you, but conceptually, this is what's going on. Current flows through a coil of wire. Whenever the magnetic flux through it is changing. The current flows one way if the flux decreases and the other way when the flux increases. These are magnetic field lines. Closer together, stronger, right? But the current induced in the wire also creates a flux of its own, whose direction depends on the direction of the current. The flux created by the induced current always opposes the change in the external flux. This rule is known as Lenz's Law. The net result of both fields added together is to slow down the rate at which the magnetic flux through any circuit is able to change. Did you catch that last part? What'd she say? When you add together the changing magnetic flux that's external and Lenz's law that's happening in the coil, the total put together field is one where Lenz's law slows down the rate of changing flux. Lenz's law acts as a brake to slow down how fast a circuit can change its flux, its current, everything else. So, I want to demonstrate that for you. Okay. I have here a aluminum uh, tube. Okay, is there, is there anything in the tube? Uh, yeah, there is. No? Is there? Is there something in the tube? Yes, no? Yeah. What? Is there, is, there, is there anything in the tube? They keep saying no, but. No. Air! There's air! <laughs> Right? See what's there, even when it's not. Okay. This, sorry, I was making fun of you. Like, that's a magnet, right? Okay, obviously. This is not, right? It's, it's the same size and shape and weight as this one, okay? It's just one of them's a magnet and one of them isn't, okay? Hold All right. Here. All right. I'm your dress. Okay, uh, move your, again, let's get it away from your iPad. Okay, all right, all right. so what I'm gonna do, okay, is I'm gonna drop the not magnet one through, okay? And we're just gonna try and see how long it's gonna take for this thing to go through. You ready to catch? Okay, here we go, three, two, one, go. Yeah. So what, like, second? Second and a half, we'll do it again. Three, two, one, go. Okay, right, all right, hold on to that one. Right. Now I'm going to drop the magnet one through. You ready? Three, two, one, go. <laughs> Is there anything in the tube? Unlocked. Just air. Yeah. Right. Okay. Nothing blocking it. Right. Okay. This is the magnet one. Go. Three, two, one, go. Anything interesting for lunch today? <laughs> Why is it taking so long for that magnet to fall? What is this thing? It's a loop of wire, right? 
it's, a, it's not literally wire, but it acts as a stacked set of conducting loops, doesn't it? The magnet comes in, and this loop, big long loop, sees a change in magnetic flux, doesn't it? But what does Lenz's law say? Ah! <laughs> right? I don't want that change. And so it fights the change in magnetic flux by producing a magnetic field opposite the direction of the bar magnet. So now you've got field pointed down from the magnet, you've got field pointed up from the loop, right? Which cancels out the magnetic field. And so the magnet comes to a stop. As soon as the magnet comes to a stop, what's the change in magnetic flux? Zero. Zero. And so the loop will say, okay, fine, good, I'm happy. No current is flowing. And as soon as no current is flowing, what is gravity going to do to this magnet? Start to pull it down again. And now the loop goes, I don't want a change in magnetic flux, so I'm going to oppose the change in magnetic flux causing a force to act upwards on the magnet, which cancels out gravity, which brings it to a stop. And now that it's stopped, what does the loop say? Good. OK. Right? And so the magnet begins to fall. And then the magnet starts falling, and the loop goes, <laughs> over and over and over again, right? So the question is, why does it even come out at all? Right? If this thing comes in, right? Wouldn't it just float there? There is friction in this system. There is energy being lost, and gravity does get to win. Okay. Where is the friction in this system? No? It's moving too slow. The friction is in the resistance that's in the aluminum metal. If this were a superconducting tube, a, something that can conduct electricity with zero resistance, which exists, by the way, for realsies, then the magnet would float. It would be perfectly balanced in this thing. Uh, superconducting is expensive. You don't want this many of them, and it would be hard to get it out. What's that mean? All right. What does that have to do? Lieutenant. Okay. Time for cooking class. Right? Okay. This, okay, is a spatula. What's this? <laughs> cooking class, not pet care class. Not a spatula. Not a, it's not a spoon. This is a pancake turner. I am not kidding. These are what these things are called. We tend to call all of these things spatulas, but a spatula does not have holes in it. A pancake turner does. Okay? Unless you're a fish spatula, which is a different. Anyway, okay? I know too much about this. What's this? A fork. Okay, good. I'm going to take the spatula, okay? And I'm going to put it on this um, armature, right, that allows it to uh, swing back and forth, right? So as you can see, there, there's friction in this pendulum, isn't there? Right? It, 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 it'll eventually slow down, right? It takes a few swings to get there, right? Okay? So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to send this thing through the poles of very strong uh, rare earth magnets. Okay, I've got, I've got the magnet set up here, right, okay? And I've got this thing down inside so that the pendulum has to pass through the magnetic field of these magnets, okay? What do we know? So this is, a, this is aluminum, it's a conductor. It's not magnetic itself. Okay, so, so there's no, is there any like force of attraction there? No, no, <laughs> aluminum isn't magnetic itself. But it is conductive, right? It'll allow currents to flow. So there's no interaction here between like, it's not like me swinging iron through, right? The iron would get attracted to the magnets, but the aluminum is not attracted to the magnets. Check this out. Wow. 
what happened? He <laughs> resisted the change. Lenz's law happened. Is what happened. Okay, this thing came to a screeching halt. Didn't even make it out of where that magnetic field is. Okay, let's uh, let's put this one in. Any predictions about what's going to happen? It is slowing down a little bit faster, but it went through several swings, didn't it? Why? This one, the pancake turner, okay? It's got a closed off edge, doesn't it? So it made it out, it went through once, but then couldn't come back out the other way, right? So not nearly as much as the solid one, not nearly as bad as the one that's a fork, right? Okay. Does the size of the loop that can form matter? The area in which these circulations can take place? Absolutely. What you are looking at right here is the basic physics. These are all bent. The basic physics of an electric car's brake. How does a standard car stop? Push pedal, go slow. Okay. In the wheel assembly, there's a brake pad and then a disc. And those pads come in and when you push on the brake, a hydraulic system magnifies the force of your push and causes these pads to come in and, and contact this spinning disc that's attached to the tire, the wheel, okay? That force of friction between the pads is what slows the car down. Where does all the car's energy go when you're just applying friction? It goes into heat. Heats up the brake pads, heats up the disc, okay? And that's energy that cannot be used for anything else. It is gone. In a electric car that runs on electricity, we can capture the electricity that's being generated by this. We stopped this thing and nothing physical actually came into contact. This is a frictionless braking system. It is a no contact braking system. In this case, we did send the energy of the oscillation into heat because what happened is we induced what's called an eddy current, E-D-D-Y, an eddy in a river, right? a, a circulation current. We produce currents, Lenz's law, right? We produce those currents, they circulate around, which is why we call them eddy currents. But in this case, we just sent it into resistance and heating up this plate. But what if we could capture the current and voltage that's circulating in this plate and send it back into the car's battery. What are you doing when you slow down in an electric car? Charging. Charging the battery. Hybrids do it too, okay? Now, because of safety and federal law, <laughs> electric cars can't just have magnetic brakes in them. They also have to have backup physical brakes in them in the event that an electrical fault Right? If you have no more electricity happening, <laughs> right? So there are standard brakes, but you can recapture like up to 80% of the energy you spent speeding up can go back into recharging the car and thus increasing its range and causing absolutely no wear and tear. There's no ablation, there's no friction, there's no reshaping of anything. Brought to you by Faraday's Law of Electromagnetic Induction 
and Lenz's law. These two coils of wire are suspended from pendulum arms. The coils are electrically connected through these steel rails so that any current flowing in one coil must also flow through the other. When one of the coils is swung in the magnetic field of a large horseshoe magnet, the other coil also begins to swing between the arms of its own magnet. If one of the magnets is turned around, the second coil swings in the opposite direction as the first coil. And they are perfectly coupled. If a thick wire is connected between the steel rails, shorting out the current, the effect stops. It can't induce anything because the current's not getting to the other coil. There's a little bit of leakage there. You can see it kind of slowing a little bit, right? But you can get perfect coupling between two coils that are connected to each other, okay? <clears throat> the other thing you can do is We've done everything today with Lenz's law in context of the magnets doing the moving and the coils sitting still. Well, Newton's third law being what it is, we can do the opposite. That's a coil, right? It's made out of metal. This right here is another coil of wire that if I send a current down, will generate a magnetic field, okay? Only this particular coil is connected directly to household voltage and current, which is alternating current. It comes out, switches its direction 120 times a second. This is a iron bar that's just there to, to multiply and magnify the effect of what I'm about to show you, okay? So if I load this thing up and I put it on the coil on the inside and I hit this switch, which is gonna turn the current on in this coil, I am all of a sudden going to create a massive change in flux through this ring. What's the ring going to do? It's going to say, uh-uh. It's going to fight it, right? And then 1 1 20th of a second later, the coil, the main coil, is going to switch. This coil, this ring is still going, wait a second, what's going on? And it's already switched. And it's going to try and fight that. It's always just going to be a little bit behind. <laughs> it's always going to be a little bit behind. Okay. What's going on? All right. So it jumps. So same material, same radius. It's just half the length right here, right? Okay. So again, here is, it's not her iPad. So there's the half height one. Any predictions as to what this is going to do? It is twice the mass. But it's also twice the number of turns, isn't it? What is this? Halo fans. <laughs> Sci-fi. Video game. U.S. Navy? This is a rail gun. I am electromagnetically propulsing an object. No gunpowder, no chemical explosives, just the power of electricity to get something to go places. And in science fiction, a rail gun is exactly that. It fires a projectile using just electricity. Okay. This it is the same size and shape as this, but it's made out of brass, right? So it's more massive than this one is. Any predictions? Not as high, right? Because same amount of energy was used, but this has more mass, right? So it's not going to accelerate fast. Okay, I've got another one right here. Right? Okay, same, same size and shape. So what should this one do? Same material, same everything. So what should it do? Same height, right? You ready? Okay. 
best day ever, right? <laughs> I got a reaction, <laughs> and it wasn't a groan. Um, <laughs> semi groan. So what? What? Why didn't this one work? Uh, Not a closed loop. I need a circulation, right? In order for Lenz's law to take place, in order for things like this to happen. Oh, uh, that's cute. <laughs> right? This is physics juggling. Okay? <laughs> right? So we call this motional EMF. Not to be confused with emotional EMF. That's your mental state while you're trying to do lens as well. <laughs> motional EMF, meaning that the EMF is causing things to move rather than taking a moving thing to cause EMF. Right? And we'll do more of this uh, motional EMF stuff when we get together on Tuesday. Tuesday will be the last, uh, no, will it? No. I've got all of next week. I've got to do this chapter on Tuesday, and then we've got to do the next chapter, which only takes one day. So we're, we're still on track. Have a fantastic four-day weekend. Be safe. Don't forget your homework. <laughs>